Hey there, what's up everyone? Thank you for joining, clicking onto the video. My name is Pastor Jennifer and I'm a pastor here at the House of Joy Church in downtown Los Angeles. Um, of course, if you're ever wanting to come join in person, we meet here on Sundays at 1030 and also Wednesdays from 7 to 9. Um, but the exciting thing is we get to be together right here, right now, online, right? On the Mighty Wind Broadcasting Network. It's Apostle Kathy Coppola's network. She is amazing, and I just love what God does in and through her. And I'm so honored to be a part of this and so honored that you would click on and hear um because today i'm going to be sharing a bit of my testimony right there's a great power on our testimonies of how god set me free from addiction specifically going to focus on how i got free from alcoholism but he set me free from some other addictions too and uh, just that even as we're starting out this year that if you are struggling with some type of bondage or cycle you're like oh i just keep doing the same thing and i don't want to do it anymore um or you know somebody that really needs help well i'm gonna share how god set me free and he's gonna do the same for you so uh get ready to hear that and uh we're just gonna flow on down the road and, and i'm gonna open up in prayer and just right we're just gonna let the holy spirit take charge of this so father Oh, I thank you that we get to come to you just so, oh, just so completely open to receive, to receive power, to be free, to receive wisdom, to receive understanding that comes from you, God, not from the world. We thank you, God, that there is a, an impartation of just a, uh, even an excitement to say, I'm not going to do some of these things that I was doing anymore. Because right now he like draws a line and he's like, yeah, as you listen to this, there is a freedom to be set free. Any chains of bondage, any cycles that you want to be free from, he says, I set you free. The Lord sets you free. He cuts through those chains in Jesus name. And as you hear, there's going to be more freedom and more revelation that you are no longer attached to those things. Those cycles are going to be dead to you. Amen. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for you leading me. I submit myself fully and completely to you. And just do what you want to do. Help me recall what you want me to recall. And um, I just thank you, Lord. And I bless each one that would listen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, well, here we go. So as I shared, I used to be um, an alcoholic. I was pretty strongly addicted to alcohol. Um, just thinking like back when I was a, a, a teenager, maybe a little before that, it was kind of the, like, I know we had some of the <clears throat> excuse me, some of that running in our family, like there'd be some of the alcoholism. And it was, in my family, it was like very functional. So you, it didn't always look so messy um, because we'd only see what was happening um, uh, behind the scenes in a sense. Like I, I always saw that like, like I, uh, they're able to keep their jobs, they're able to have good jobs, they're able to look like they have it all together. And yet there was like, and so I grew up kind of thinking it was normal to have alcohol around or, um, you know, and, and, and that you just got to learn how to like handle it and keep your composure. And so as I witnessed other adults that I respected drinking, I had a curiosity um, and I was a Christian growing up. I grew up in a Christian home. But I had that, you know, I think many of us when we're younger, we're like, I want to try what this is. Like, why are the, the adults so into this like liquid? <laughs> like, why, they, they, why is this adult drink so special? So with that, I just, I would begin to try it, you know, maybe uh, when I was 13, 14 and, uh, you know, sneaking it from parents, you know, collections, um, even at a friend's house, you know. And I just remember though, something in me, connected to the feeling of alcohol almost immediately 
I knew the taste was a little bit off, a little bit weird, a little bit different, but I remember that burn going down and it was something I liked. I was like, I can feel that. I liked the feeling of the burn of the alcohol. Maybe that's strange, but I liked it. And it was like ever since I kind of had those first tastes, I just wanted more. And uh, I could feel, you know, some of that, like where you get that sensation that you feel calmed down. And for me, I always had a pretty strong um, uh, struggle with anxiety, especially social anxiety. I had a lot of discomfort of, of being around people, extremely uh, self-conscious. And um, so I, I feel like everything I did is wrong. And so I would be very anxious. And I realized if I drank alcohol, um, it would give me a calming effect, right? So from early on, because uh, then by the time 15, 16, 17, I had ways that I could get more access to it. And I just began to rely on it more and more. And I'd sneak it into high school and into water bottles. And um, and I, yeah, I, would, I would talk people into buying me liquor at liquor stores when I was underage. I, I found a way. Um, right, that addiction starts to set in. You start to be like, I'm dependent on this to function. And we all as humans have a desire to, right, feel comfortable. We want to feel pleasure. We want to feel um, uh, good. Uh, and so if we don't fully know how to yet connect to the goodness of God's presence, um, that old sinful nature and if we're just relying on ourselves to comfort what isn't whole uh, in Christ yet, right? We'll find these different ways to comfort us. And that's what I, my body began to learn to do. My mind began to have a habit of going to alcohol to use it to function and to numb any uncomfortable uh, emotions um, that I would have. And, right, and you might struggle with something and it might not be necessarily alcohol or someone you know right it could be that you're you know another like a drug or it could be porn it could be sex it could be right that you just you just can't stop buying stuff on amazon and you're like oh here i go again um whatever those things are you get a temporary fix a temporary feel good but then right after or the day after the shame comes the guilt comes the oh man i want to be free and I'm saying I had this addiction growing stronger in me. And this is as being a believer. I knew, I knew without a doubt God was real. I absolutely loved his word and of course still love his word. But, but in the midst of that, I had not connected to his grace or his power. I had never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, I grew up in a Baptist church. We had a great love for the word, but I had never seen the power of God actually set someone free. And so for me, I'm like, well, I, I don't, I just, I wasn't quite sure how to get free. Um, this addiction began to grow worse. I would try to, um, I, I, as I, I was legally, you know, got a little older, able to drink, I would, it just, it, it was no longer that I had control over it, right? It, it began to have control over me and I could not imagine living without it. It was, I, I, I had to have it every day. I, if I wasn't, I didn't have alcohol at home, you know, I'm thinking and planning all my thoughts are about, okay, I got to go into this liquor store. I got to go to the gas station. I wouldn't want to be seen. Um, Right, you don't want to be the one that's always going into the store like every night, but it turns in you end up becoming that person sometimes. And so it was like, I just, I had to always have alcohol. I had to have alcohol for any social functions. I had to have alcohol. I'm an artist full time um, uh, for the last 20 years. Um, and so that comes with a lot of drinking being normal. So I, it was fine for me to drink on the job and almost expected. Um, there was a lot of drinking in my family. So that was also totally like fine and expected. So everywhere I went, it was just like alcohol was always available. And, if, and but I had to make sure it was always available. It was in my purse. I, I sometimes would have a flask, and like just in case I need a little comfort and I'm uncomfortable and I have anxiety, I would use, you know, have a shot. Um, so just saying that it got to be, I was fully reliant on it daily. Um, and I, I made sure that I, I connected with 
um, even in my my marriage, my boyfriends, like who ended up becoming my husband, um, that was like a prerequisite. Like I was like, I want to make sure I have a drinking partner. And so we were full on drinking partners. Like that was what we did. When we're off work. We're at the bar and we're getting not the little drinks. We get the big beers. Right. And it was like a cycle that I just I, I was, I hated myself for it. And yet I would just keep doing it. Right. Have you been there where you're like, I just keep doing that thing. I don't want to do anymore. And, um, as that progressed, um, you know, I'd wake up with the hangovers and yet I would have the word. I would always spend the mornings in the word and I'd have these hangovers. It was like beer and a Bible. And, um, I would be like, oh God, I want to get free, Lord. But I would do it all in my own effort, all in my own plan. So sometimes I'd come up with these, because I was always a very strong-willed, like able to do things and accomplish things. So I would really rely on my ability, not knowing that I had never really uh, relied on God's power and his ability. And so I would have these like, I'm only going to drink one tonight. Or I'm only going to drink on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'd like mark it out on my calendar. And I'm like, that'll be good. I can handle it. And it would never work. I could never uh, hold up to my own like plan for freedom. Um, and I, but it just kept getting steeper and steeper. This is like going on for like, I don't know, it would be like 15 years. Uh, but it, it was getting worse. Um, and, you know, I, I, I had gotten in, like, you know, having a DUI, getting pulled over um, by cops and all of that, um, that really terrified me. And I thought that was going to scare me enough to uh, shape up. And I, I was only sober for like a week after that scare and I was back drinking again. Um, it just, uh, nothing could quite shake it. Um, and in my marriage, we ultimately got married and still, you know, heavy drinkers and things were escalating in that realm as well. It was getting more, we were getting more like verbally, uh, just in these really rough fights, I'd be just screaming. And we got to the point where, um, we even got physical, you know, I'd be throwing a beer bottle and, um, and you know, smashing it against the wall or just throwing my wedding ring off in a bar, just getting reckless, right? Like so embarrassing, so reckless. And, um, and to the point where even physically there was some abuse. And I, I was always like, no, that's not cool. Like we're not going to be to that level. And I just remember, um, like I was finally getting to that, that point of like, oh, like I can't, do this anymore this can't be a day after day after day and at the same time i remember i was dealing with a lot of mental torment and that was part of what you know i was trying to medicate with the alcohol and i remember i i had um this is i don't know i know i'm rambling on some of the story but um just some of the pain that that, that i remember some of the shame like in the midst of this, though, I was like, um, I had a name, a reputation as a well-known artist in my city, like of Las Vegas. And so I also, it was like people all thought that I was fine, that I was good, that I was fully healthy, that I couldn't possibly be struggling with something. And I always felt like I had to hide and have this, this one version of me while the other real version of me was falling apart. And, um, so that was painful, but I remember getting to a point, this was like in my 20s, um, I was so tormented inside and, and um, suicidal, full of anxiety. I was having increasing uh, like panic attacks. They were really terrifying. And I just, I felt like I just, it just wasn't working. And so I remember going to also a psychiatrist for the first time. And I felt so much shame in that. I was like, I can't believe that I'm here in this spot. And, but they did a test on my liver uh, because they were going to put me on some medication um, and ends up, they said my liver at that point, she's like, she's like, how much are you drinking? She's like, your liver is, she compared it to a, a male in his, they're like, your liver is as if it's like a 50 year old male that's been drinking his whole life. So I literally had been damaging my liver 
Um, and uh, that was another one of those times where it hit me hard. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm really doing this to myself. Like I'm really, really like, this is not good. And again, the addiction was strong. So I couldn't, I, I would stay like sober for like a week and then I'd be back to drinking. And um, so I was just, I was right in bondage. And this is for, for years and years. Um, and as I said, I would wake up though, and I would always spend time in the word and all this time while I'm not living full out for God. And I was definitely in sin in other ways. I had a you no know, addiction to some other things like smoking. I was addicted to porn. Actually, I was, um, just, there was some messy stuff. I was not living God's way. And when we don't live God's way, it is just, it gets messy and sin begins to have its, it, it, its way where sin, the wages of sin is death, right? The wages of sin or the, the, the way of the enemy is to still kill and destroy. And I thought I could play in the enemy's camp while loving God. And it just wasn't working. I was starting to see this terrible effect that the sin and the addiction was bringing into my life. And, but I would, I'd be with the Bible and I would always write as God would speak to me. Yes, he speaks to us, even in the midst of sin. He, he loves us. He has mercy on us and he is there. And, and I just remember he would be so loving and he would say, Jen, you've got to give up, like give up the alcohol. Let me be your God. Cause truly Budweiser was my King. <laughs> I was trying to have Budweiser as my King and Jesus as my king, and it just wasn't working to bow down the two, right? He's like, You're, you have to give it up, give it up. And I would, um, I, I would, I don't know, I guess I would just do it in my own effort time and time again. And, and I thought I was surrendering, but I must have not been because um, it just went on as a struggle like that. I'm like, yes, God, I give it up. I don't want to do this. Help me. And I would say that. But something I think just hadn't clicked yet, something where I hadn't fully surrendered. But what happened ultimately, as things were progressing and there was more of, like I said, some of the chaos, some of the dysfunction um, happening in my marriage and in my life, and I, I um, was, it was just, I was seeing the effects of it. Um, that one morning as I'm there in the Bible, Jesus uh, speaks to me and I was closing my eyes in prayer and oftentimes he speaks to me in vision. And so I'm there and I'm like, you know, usually I'd be hung over. <laughs> so miserable wanting a new brain because I was like, oh, and so I'm there miserable, right? Like, how am I going to get free? But he shows me this vision and it's two mountains. And one mountain is like all this dark, black, like demonic stuff. I mean, it was just like the things that were going to happen if I did not surrender to him setting me free. And so it was like, I could see it. And I just sensed it was, you know, things like divorce, things like abuse, things like, uh, you know, losing um, uh, the, the, the blessings, like uh, financially and things like that. It's just, it was just gross. Um, all of the enemy's plan, if I wanted to hold on as, King Budweiser, you know, <laughs> so, but then I saw this other mountain, this pile of diamonds, and it was much bigger than the dark pile, it was so big and so beautiful, and it was glistening and so pure, it's the pile of diamonds, and he's like, Jennifer, if you will trust me, if you will give it up today, he's like, I will bless you beyond measure. And for whatever reason, that particular day, he gave me grace. And I think I felt grace it wasn't fully the first time, but it was, I remember the first time I felt grace was, you know, he set me free from smoking. I finally started to trust him. Um, but this was another time where it was like, I tried so many times to get free in my own effort, my own plan, my own self-discipline. But he's, it was like the time was there. He's like, trust me. I will deliver you from this. Just trust me. I'm going to bless you beyond measure. And that day, and it was not like some special, like, power of God came upon me and I was, you know, really feeling something. 
I can't say that I, I, I just knew there was something that just changed and I received his promise. I'm like, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with this. And from that day, this was in 2009, um, like it was December, uh, it's pretty much like my husband's birthday, December 20th, December 21st. Um, no, it was December 18th. That's what it was. December 18th. Um, in 2009, he set me free when, and, and I did, I just surrendered. I said, yes, Lord, I want, I want to choose the good way. I want to choose to be free. And that's all I could say. Something shifted. No one prayed for me. He just presented it to me. And ever since that day, um, I have never gone back to drinking. I just, but I, I had to make a, 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 a I did have to make a choice. I had to turn to repent, to say, I'm not going to do it. Um, but it was by his grace. And it was like, okay, I guess I'm free. And the interesting thing was, um, I didn't know, you know, I had to test it out. Like, um, I'm like, I'm, I had to mean it. I had to mean it, right? If you're going through something that God is like, I need you to, in your heart, say, I surrender. I'm not, I come out of agreement with this addiction, right? I come out of agreement. I renounce, like, I just, I'm done. And, and God, I, I, I need your grace to be free. And um, as I moved on for the next days, um, like, what is this going to feel like? Because I was terrified as one who was an alcoholic who relied on that to manage my emotions and all the wounds and stuff in my heart, in my mind, like, um, was terrified to like face my emotions on my own, like, or like just sober. And um, he, night after night was, instead of going to the bar, it was like, um, he, he made a way out. And so what I relied on, on this scripture is because I knew I was going to be confronted with all these situations. Like when I'm out with my family, Hey, Jennifer, do you want to drink? Or when I'm out with my husband who's you know still drinking at that time god has set him free as well amen it's been a journey and just just like me he set my husband just free recently and um he is faithful he just does it in his timing but i had to i knew that i was going to be sober in my marriage and i couldn't control my husband i couldn't tell him what he had to do i had to be ready to be sober between me and god in the midst of an alcoholic like home so um I, I had to be prepared god's grace was going to bring me through this i'm holding on to you god i'm holding on to your word right so this is what happens when you are coming out of your addiction right you just you start to just cling to him cling to christ cling to the promise cling to his word that sets us free the truth sets us free and um and, and also I knew that I was going to be coming still to the same art shows. They're going to have someone with a tray of wine and champagne. Oh, would you like a drink? And I had to be prepared. So I was, I would literally practice saying, um, no, thank you. I don't drink. No, thank you. Like I would practice and set my mind before going out in public um, to these functions to be ready to respond correctly so sometimes they're right it's yes god's grace is there but he's like you're gonna hold my hand i'm gonna walk you through it and i'm gonna show you a way out i'm gonna give you the strength to not give in to the temptation but i had to always set my mind before going into these situations and i'm sharing that because right if you're needing to get free from something there is that place of i'm gonna set my mind when i'm at home alone on the computer i'm not gonna you know, have porn available, or when I'm, uh, I'm talking about other addictions. Um, if it's the shopping, um, you know, like that you're, you're going to take Amazon off of the front screen or, or take the credit card, and put it, chop it up, put it somewhere. Um, there is wisdom in you shut down that thing. You don't put it in front of you. You, you put it away. Um, and so, um, this is the scripture I would hold on to, though. It's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. 
When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. This was life to me during that time. I'm like this. I'm just holding on to this promise. I am holding on to this truth. His word is living and active. This is my escape route. I was like, every time a situation comes up or I'm tempted or I have an empty time and I'm not going to know what to do with it and I'm going to want to, my natural way would be like, let me go to the bar. I'm like, nope, God's going to provide a way out. God is faithful. And to realize it says the temptations in our life, the temptation in your life, the temptation that he's wanting you to, you know, like the enemy's wanting you to just bow to that same thing again, that familiar thing. He's like, no, you're not alone in this. The enemy always wants us to be isolated, think that no one else is going through it, but you are not alone in it. These temptations come to all of us. Yes, different flavors, different ways, but the temptations come. We are going to be tested and, um, and tried, and we need to know that we are not alone. You're not alone. I've been through this. My husband's been through this. Um, whatever that addiction might look like, whatever. I mean, there's so many different ones that you know can be out there. Um, that we've all been um, tempted, um, and we're not alone. But this is it. God is faithful. God is right there. God is, you got to bring him in and say, God, I'm not going to go live and do this addiction as if you're not there. No, I'm going to walk with you. God, you are faithful to rescue me. You are faithful to allow. It says he, he, God will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. He doesn't say it's not going to be taken. He doesn't say I'm just going to take it away. He's like, yeah, the enemy is going to, he's going to try to tempt, but I promise you, he says, that, that it won't allow it to be more than you can stand. So you have to go as a soldier with a mindset and say, I know the enemy's there. He's going to try, but no, my God is faithful. He is with me. He has given me his grace, his ability, his power to have me walk right in the midst of that, 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 that thing, that situation that used to have a grip on me. And I decree and declare it has no grip on me. It has no grip on you anymore. You come with a mindset of faith that he will not allow that temptation to be more than you can stand. Um, it says, when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So that was the key for me is he will show you a way out when the temptation comes. So what would happen during that time when I was because it was like a tender, fragile season when I'm just starting to walk my freedom out in his grace. And it was during the holidays, right? It was during Christmas when everyone, you know, is kind of like, woo, having fun and having these get togethers and drinking. And so um, I was like, hey God, you're gonna make a way out. You're gonna make a way out. like." What am I going to do the next night when I'm going to want to be tempted to go to the bar, tempted to have free time, and I'm going to want to, like, how am I going to shift? So these are their practical things to walk it out. I was like, Lord, I pray that you would give me new things, healthy things that I can say yes to. And so it's interesting. He would put these opportunities up, um, like the first one that just comes to mind is I got invited to judge a cookie contest for kids, like a Christmas cookie contest. I would not have been interested so much in that. I would have been like, no, I wanna be at the bar getting drunk. But that God was providing a way out. And so it was like, I, you know, like a Friday or Saturday night. And I'm like, yes, of course, I'll come judge your cookie contest and hang out with kids. So, um, and I knew it would help me stay busy. It would help me serve other people. It would help me be around a healthy atmosphere and shift my mind from the old patterns of thinking. So this is, he would keep putting these healthy invitations in my path. And all I had to do was say yes to them. And it started to shift the way that I would use my time. And night after night, and even with dinners with family, uh, you know, even if they said, hey, would you like a drink? I was like, no, no, I'm good. I'm just going to do some seltzer water. And um, I was like, oh my gosh, this isn't even a struggle. Like God's grace has absolutely given me like the desire is like just gone. And it was like, yeah, the temptation, like it would be presented, but I was like so protected and so covered. And every day that I got more free, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm functioning apart from that old dependency. Oh my gosh. Like, 
I started to learn who I really am and starting to actually love who I am. Starting to realize that I could be crazy and silly without having to be drunk and silly. And like, and there was such a beautiful freedom that I was starting to experience. And this is why, right, to be excited at the beginning of the year, if there is something that you're hooked on, that he has grace right now to set you free. And it doesn't have to be like, whoa, like I feel like the power of God. Yeah, you know, that's, I love it, right, the power of God. But it, I'm saying at that point, I had never experienced um, like, like a manifestation, I'd say, of his power. It was simply an a invitation and God's giving you an invitation today. That's why he's asking. He says like, in Revelation, it says like, we overcome the accuser by the blood of the lamb, right? The blood of Jesus who forgives us and wipes us clean. All that slate of addiction, all that history of sin has been covered by the blood. He has wiped you clean from as far as the east is from the west. You are clean. And he says, and by the word of of our testimony. As I share the word of the testimony that God has set me free, there is power on the words to set you free. You surrender. You say, God, I'm done. And you put those things away. You, you trust in his grace. You set your mind to say, I'm going to focus on the goodness of God. I'm going to focus on his faithfulness, that he is giving me this promise. He will provide a way out. The temptation's not going to be more than I can stand. And I'm walking in freedom land. <laughs> I'm walking in freedom land in 2022. Whatever it is, shut it down. Whatever that bondage is, he, he, right now there's grace to be free, but cooperate with him, walk with him, shut it down, put it away, take it out of sight, out of mind, and just fix your eyes on Jesus. He says, that's how we stay clean and clear of sin that so easily wants to tie us up and entrap us. It says we win the race by fixing our eyes on Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you're helping me right now. Jesus, I thank you that though the enemy is close in my ear, Lord, I thank you that you're the one. You're the one who is stronger. You're the one who is faithful, right? And so there is a, a place, right, where we do contend in faith, but it's his grace that is upon you right now. So just reach out, reach out and, and receive that. Um, and um, what I love too, Ephesians 5.18, um, like this is what I've learned over the years. Well, one, like after addiction, right? The addiction is kind of the surface thing, really. That's the thing where any of us who have been in addiction, you know, I remember when I was addicted to smoking, that was a hard one. It was same thing. I was like, it's all this anxiety and stuff. And like, I had to have this habit of when I wake up, I got to smoke. When I'm in the car, I got to smoke. When I, and, and um, it was a, you know, God set me free from that. Um, uh, but I had to, I had to make some conscious effort to not buy the thing. I remember I would use Twizzlers as like a, a, a an in-between thing to like break my habit. Um, but I, free from that, that's a hard one to get free from. And he sets you free from smoking, free from that habit. Put it down, put it away. If you gotta get Twizzlers or something, do it, but, but just focus on him. God, I thank you that I'm free. God, I don't need that anymore. God, I'm going to just, I'm going to breathe in the smoke of the glory of God. That's what's going to fill my lungs. Breathe in the glory of God. You can get high on the glory of God. So, um, porn, right? That was something also, as I mentioned, I used to have such a pull in my life. And, and, um, but I, I remember it had to be removed from our house. He convicted me. I, I'm like, nope, this is not for me anymore. This is, I'm cleaning up, we're cleaning up. I remember when he got a hold of my heart, got me back going to church again. Um, uh, this is many years ago, but that was one of the things he's like, conviction happened. I'm like, I can't, we can't have this nasty filth in our house. And we just got rid of it. Um, and anything that was on my computer, I just, you know, shut it down, take it out. So I'm just saying this because I mean, I have no shame talking about any of that stuff because I'm so free from it. It has nothing on me. And so just sometimes, it's, especially if you're a believer and you're like, oh, I'm going through this. That's I'm sharing it because I want you to know that even as a believer, um, 
you are not alone in this, this battle to be free. Um, but God gives grace to be free. But I'm saying we've got to partner with him, do our part and walk forward. His grace is there with you. Um, but it says in Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine, right? Because that will ruin your life, right? That's what it does. <laughs> it ruins our life, whatever that thing is, whatever we're drunk with, whatever we keep filling our time and putting our money towards that is not of God. Um, and and, and it, that will ruin our life. That's not cool. We ain't doing that. Instead, he's like, I love that he like, he takes the one thing away, but he's like, no, instead, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I know in the message version of that, it says, like, to drink huge drafts, right? Huge, like, it makes me think of when I used to drink the big, big frosty mugs of the beer. And I was like, oh, God, you gave me a replacement. I get to now drink these big crafts of your Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And I remember, like, I used to, I never knew what the joy was like from God, but years down the road, <laughs> um, I finally encountered like what it is to be full of like drinking the presence of God and being baptized in the Holy Spirit and his joy, like literally being drunk on his joy. I mean, he keeps me drunk a lot of the time and it's literally like drank from his face, drank from his presence. We worship him. We look at him in the midst of whatever temptations, in the midst of whatever lies the enemy's spewing at us. Um, we just start to be like, oh, I'm going to just honor God. I'm going to just love him. He's the one who's full. It says in his words, the fullness of joy is in his presence at his right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. And I'm like, oh God, I'm going to just drink on you. I'm going to just drink on you. And just like we would drink a drink in the natural, you begin to drink it in the spirit. Yes, invisible, but so full of his substance. And there starts to be this, by faith, a drunkenness that scripture says, be fully filled with the Holy Spirit, singing songs to him. And that's part of the way, if we want to be drunk in the Holy Spirit, worship him, just sing songs to him. And it goes stronger and stronger till you're just inebriated on him. Oh, his presence is what I'm addicted to now. His presence is life. His presence is what he's reconnecting you to. He says you can't drink from two streams. You can't have, like, try to get fulfillment from something that is not ever going to satisfy you and try to drink from the stream of God. It's always going to cause this yuck, like this collision. So he's like, put the other thing down by my grace right now today and begin to drink from my face, begin to drink from my spirit, begin to drink from my river of delight. Will you do that? Will you put the other thing down and trust him today? <laughs> he is so good. His presence is your new addiction, his presence. If you're not, I mean, maybe you're already like, no, I know what the presence of God is like. But if you don't, you got to hook up to that hose of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> He's, he wants you to be drinking from him constantly. You can have as much as you want. And you never get a hangover. It's awesome. It's so good. He's free. It costs a lot <laughs> to give himself to us. But he's it's a free drink, always there, always there, always there. And so I'm just going to share too, wow, well, his faithfulness. Sometimes, right, God can give his visions. Like I mentioned the vision of the two mountains. There was that mountain of the destruction that my addiction was going to keep leading me down uh, that path if I chose it, right? He gives us free will. He's like, I love you, but I'm warning you. If you go your way and you keep resisting me, you keep trusting in Budweiser as your king. <laughs> He's like, it's going to destroy much of your life. But then, right, the other mountain, the beautiful one that I decided to choose and go God's way. He says, I'll bless you beyond measure. And it was a pile of diamonds. I'm not a diamonds-like type of girl, but I was like, okay, like diamonds, beautiful, cool, right? I knew what they represented, right? Like, I mean, um, it also, yeah, well, I'm not going to say that, but so the, the interesting thing is sometimes God can give us vision and we'll think it's just for that particular, you know, situation in the present, like, okay, yeah, I'm getting free. I'm, I'm moving on to the greater blessings beyond measure. But what's really interesting is he played this particular vision out in real life. Um, 
uh, what years later, it was 2009 when I got set free and had that vision. And then in 2000, uh, like 13, 2000, uh, yeah, I think it was 2013, um, he gave a space. Uh, my husband and I moved to Los Angeles. Um, it, that was totally a God thing, absolute faith. I left everything. We left everything we knew back in Las Vegas where we were well established. And uh, God's like, no, you're going to go to downtown LA and you're going to know nobody and you're going to completely trust me. And so we come to Los Angeles. He happens to put us in a space that is right in the middle of the jewelry district. Like we are surrounded by buildings that are full of diamonds, full of gemstones. And right, all the signs even outside are like diamonds, diamonds, diamonds. Um, and on 7th and Hill, uh, those are our streets here at the House of Joy. And uh, it's interesting because um, Jerusalem is known as a city on seven hills. So it's like we, this church, I never thought that I would be leading a church. I never thought that I, I would never chose to be in ministry. I wouldn't have looked for that. I wouldn't have... But he's like, no, I've got a plan for all these things, all this, this journey that I'm taking you on, um, all the, the, the testimony of freedom. Like he goes, I'm going to plant you in Los Angeles, little did I know, in the midst of a pile of diamonds. And he has blessed us beyond measure, and he's only just begun what he's going to continue to do. It's only going to get better. But we have been well established here uh, by the hand of God, by the favor of God, his grace upon us, keeping us. We've been in this building now for um, about eight years uh, here in the midst of the jewelry district. And so I just want to share that because whatever he's promising you now, even in the sense of maybe it's fresh new freedom, even starting today, um, that his faithfulness just keeps playing out. It just gets better. Stay the course. God is faithful. His grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in our weakness. I get when we feel addicted, we feel weak. We feel we don't have the strength and that's because we don't. So we have to say, God, I'm going to just say the truth. I'm going to walk on it by faith. I thank you, God, that I am free. So say, I thank you. Like say it out loud. Thank you, God. I thank you that I am free as of today. I come out of agreement. Say it. I come out of agreement with whatever that addiction might be, whatever that struggle is. Say, I renounce it, right? I cancel it fully. And just, yeah, we just say, God, I thank you for separating anyone right now who is wanting to be free and, and just giving them great grace to be able to walk forward, seeking your face, Lord, your face to ace the race. We need your grace <laughs> to ace the race, and that is by seeking your face. And so I thank you that you are giving people massive grace right now to just be drunk on you so that they lose the whole, like, wanting to hold on to the other junk. And, and, and that... Um, oh, there's two things, but yeah, as, as he has established me now years down the road, uh, sober and full of his goodness, full of his blessings, um, and, and, and not a, no struggles with addiction, like, right. It feels so good to be free. And just that, um, he's got a long-term plan for you. It's just the beginning as you let go. He has all, everything that you're going through. He doesn't use or, or, or waste a single bit of it. He's literally working all things together for good as you've put your trust in him. So yes, there can, it can be hard at times. There can be days that are harder than others. But just saying, I'm seeing like five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road, remain faithful to him. And he is more than faithful to you. He will bless you beyond measure, just like he says to me. And I just, I just impart that same thing to you. Blessings beyond measure. Say yes to him. And that last thing, I, I think I went off course somewhere, but um, I, the addiction I, was, I had mentioned, is it's, that's the surface thing. We want to get free of that. But right, we're usually in that addiction because we're trying to cover up, numb, and cope, medicate wounds and hurts and things in our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, ways we've been mistreated, ways we've been abused, ways we shouldn't have been talked to, um, just whatever it may be. And so 
it's not like, oh, addiction's gone, everything's fine. No, that was just the beginning of a journey to then say, God, okay, if you did that for me, whew, I was like, if you did that for me, now I can face my emotions. Now I can face the hurt, the wounds, the pain. And I mean, that's an ongoing journey, like to keep getting healing, keep getting freedom. And, um, but if we can trust him with that first step of letting go of the addiction so that we can begin to think clear, so that we can begin to process things healthy with God, um, he will do the next steps. And I'll just mention for me, one of those big steps was, uh, I, I was actually a book um, by Joyce Meyer, Battlefield of the Mind. Um, man, I put that to practice, like hardcore. I pra I mean, I, I, I just, I put it into practice. All I can say is that book helped change my life and get my thinking right and know that I wasn't alone. That was so relatable and completely all the Bible, uh, but such a good book. Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer. Um, so that's it, right? It is an ongoing journey to get continuous freedom and healing. And the more that we trust him, it is step-by-step, -step, ongoing process. It is so worth it. So worth it, right? So um, I pray that this has encouraged you to be like, yo, I'm done. I'm done with whatever this stuff has that's had a hold on me. And, um, right, and the power of God that you say yes to it and you move forward in this new year excited to fix our eyes on him, fix your eyes on the benefits of following him. That's another thing. What we fix our eyes on is what we're going to go towards. If we keep fixing our eyes on not doing that thing, we're going to pretty much want to keep doing that thing. So literally turn the other way so that you're not looking at it. You're not thinking about it. Plan ahead about ways to fill your mind on what is good in advance so that you replace what you used to do, the time you used to spend doing that other thing. You replace it now with God with his word, with worship, with wholesome, good activities, and um, definitely necessary to start to be, you got to be planted in a, 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 a really solid church community. And I remember praying for Christian friends, because um, I didn't used to have any Christian friends. And um, God has so been faithful to give me strong Christian friends and community over the years that helped me stay accountable um, and encouraged. Um, and be able to be honest and all that and share the journey, right? So we don't do this alone. And so I bless you and I'm going to finish here. I pray that you would share this and with anyone that might need it. And if you're the one that needs it, this is the beginning of a brand new start by the grace of God in Jesus name. God bless you and I'll see you soon. All right. Bye.